It is good to be with you tonight. I hope all of you are doing well. If you're able to join us this coming Sunday morning at 9 a.m., this would be a great time right now to sign up online. If you do not have internet access or if you need my help with signing up in any way, get in touch with me or also get in touch with Kenna. Or if you know a member who does not have internet access, uh, you could help them sign up. Or if you don't have internet access yourself, certainly could get in touch with me, Kenna, or anybody with internet access who has an account on the church website. And they can just add you to their number and that works for us. But it's just good to know how many are coming so we can be sure to comply with the local health department limits on the number of people we can have in our building. Uh, thank you for being so understanding with this. It is so strange, isn't it, to... Uh, have to have a ticket, I guess, or a reservation to come to church. And I know that's not really what it is, but if all of us sign up, that gives us more flexibility and welcoming guests. I know several times the last few months we've had people get in touch with us on Saturday uh, asking if we have room for them. And I can look at the sign-up page very quickly and I can say, yes, we only have 17 people and we have a limit of 30. And so we hope to see you in the morning kind of thing. So again, if you sign up, that really helps with this. And I appreciate your understanding with all of this. Uh, tonight we start a brand new study of the book of Acts. And maybe a good way to start would be with the title of the book. And look at that for just a moment. Generally, books of the Bible do not have inspired titles. But they often have descriptions. And that's certainly what we have here with the book of Acts. Uh, some translations refer to this very simply as the book of Acts, and that is a good description of what it is. Some refer to this as the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, years ago, we studied the Bible with a Chinese man in a nursing home down in Janesville. I think his name was Fred Guan, and I can't remember how we got in touch with him. We heard there was this guy in a nursing home who wanted to study the Bible, and so we went over there, we met with him, got to know him a little bit. And uh, he was fairly new to our country and barely spoke any English at all. But we heard that he wanted to study the Bible, so we went over there. And I don't know whether you've ever tried to find a book in the Bible in another language, if you don't know that language, but that's kind of what we did that afternoon. He had a Chinese Bible. And so based on nothing but the size and arrangements of the books, we found a blank page between the old and the new. And so... All the books on this side of the blank page, it's bigger, so that's the old, and you know the smaller chunk is the new, and so we know this is the New Testament. And so we started looking at the divisions, and we found what we assumed to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, based on the length of those books, and then we were fairly confident that we were at the book of Acts, and that's where we wanted to study the Bible with this man in order to teach him how to obey the gospel. And so we pointed to the title of what we assumed was the fifth book of the New Testament. And in very broken English, he said, this is the book of gospel action. The book of gospel action. And I think about that every single time I study the book of Acts now. It is the book of gospel action. And I would also point out, for the benefit of those who are joining us on the phone, this is not the book of Acts, A-X-E, <laughs> But it is the book of Acts, A-C-T-S. It is a book of action. And specifically, it is a record of the actions of the apostles. And even more specifically, it is primarily about the actions of only two of the apostles, Peter and Paul. There are a few mentioned here and there, but this is a book primarily about Peter and Paul. In fact, one very rough outline of the book of Acts is this. Chapters 1 through 12 are about Peter, and chapters 13 through 28 are about Paul. I know some people are really big into outlining books of the Bible. That has never really been a, a concern with me, but if that is with you, then that is one very uh, simple two-point outline. We have Peter, and then we have Paul. And again, others are referred to here and there. We have references in the book to Judas and John and James and Peter and Paul, but the, the book focuses very heavily on Peter and Paul. Uh, some have suggested that we call the book Some of the Acts of Some of the Apostles. And I get a kick out of that. I appreciate that. That, that would be very accurate. Some of the Acts of Some of the Apostles. doesn't really roll off the tongue like the others, but uh, that, that would be an accurate description of what's here. Uh, thanks to Luke, we know about Peter and Paul, but we really have no inspired record of what happened with the others, Matthew and Thomas and the other apostles. And that's kind of amazing to me to think about all of the amazing things that happened just with Peter and Paul. 
And I'm assuming that similar amazing things happened with the others. We just don't have a record of that as they went out into all the world preaching the gospel to all of creation. Uh, much has been written on Acts in terms of background, but it seems best to me to get to the text as soon as possible. So we'll just jump right into it here. Uh, some of you know a few weeks ago I was visiting at another congregation and in their 45-minute Bible class, it took 29 minutes to get to the Bible. Think about that for just a moment. 45 minutes set aside for studying the Bible once a week, and it took them 29 minutes to get to it. That is not okay. And it's not that I was watching the clock the whole time. That's not it at all. But uh, 10 to 15 minutes in, I, I started wondering, this is a Bible class. I am in a, a church, and, and yet they're still talking about stuff, uh, you know, the weather and and, and that kind of thing. And I, and I started paying attention at that point. And 29 minutes in, the teacher finally referred to an actual passage from the Bible in a Bible class. So we don't want to put it off 29 minutes tonight. So let's just jump in rather quickly with the actual Word of God. Uh, the first paragraph is Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So a very short little section here to begin. I hope you have a Bible with you tonight. If not, I'll continue to try to put the passages on the screen as we did for the book of Luke. It seems to help those at home. And uh, our first paragraph is Acts 1 verses 1 and 2, and this is how it starts. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So right away, the very first line invites a question, doesn't it? The author refers to his first account. And so now we need to know, what is that about? This is the second account. And so if this is volume two, exactly what is volume one? What is the first account? Well, the first clue is that the author of this book, um, the first clue about the author is the name of the recipient. So the book of Acts is written to a guy named Theophilus. And that right there should be pretty familiar to us. Uh, where else in the Bible do we read about Theophilus? There are not too many Theophiluses in the Bible, are there? And so the other reference to Theophilus, of course, is in the book of Luke. And I don't think we need to read this again, but I put it on the screen here in the opening verses of Luke. He explains that he's writing to this man named Theophilus. Theophilus is a name meaning lover of God or friend of God or loved by God. Kind of hard to nail that down, but love and God are the two parts of his name. Uh, some have speculated that Theophilus is either a new convert to the Christian faith or the author of Luke and Acts wants him to be a new convert to the Christian faith. And so the author is writing to either uh, convince the man to obey the gospel or he's trying to uh, strengthen this man's faith based on the author referring to this man as the most excellent Theophilus. And since that title was also used with reference to Roman governors Felix and Festus later in the book of Acts, uh, some have assumed that Theophilus is perhaps some kind of Roman government official. And that is a possibility here. Remember, the book of Acts ends in Rome. So there's a chance that when the author is writing this book in the book of Rome, as he accompanies Paul, he runs into this man, and so he's some kind of Roman government official. But anyway, he's referred to as Most Excellent Theophilus, which was a common way of referring to some kind of government official. Um, so he could be a government official, he could be wealthy, could be both, a wealthy government official. And it's possible, as we kind of speculated in our study of Luke, that Theophilus is sponsoring these two volumes. It was common in the ancient world for a wealthy benefactor to pay for somebody's time and expenses to write or research a book. And that may be what's going on here. I'm not saying that it was, but it is a possibility. That's the way things were commonly done. Uh, writing of books was very expensive. And if you think copying a, a large, just copying a book like Acts by hand would take a number of weeks or months to get it right. And, and you figure in the cost of labor and just writing a book, including the research to it, would be a rather a huge expenditure, and so it was common to have a wealthy donor to kind of sponsor that process. Uh, with the common references in both books, most people agree then that Luke and Acts were both written by Luke. They are very similar in style. There, are, there is some similar grammar. You know, the way different people talk, we can even see a written sentence, and we can say, that sounds like this person that I know, and that's very uh, much the case in the book of Luke. There are some similarities between these two books, similar style, similar grammar, some of the same terminology, the way he words things, the words themselves. 
as I remember it, we have uh, roughly 50 words that are found in both Luke and Acts that are not found anywhere else in the New Testament. And that's significant. That's a lot of words for one man to use and nobody else to use. So there's uh, something about his education. There's something about his background that, that gives him access to words that other people didn't commonly use. And that's kind of interesting. So one more reason to believe that both books were written by the same author. A critical introduction to the New Testament was probably the most difficult class that I ever had at the undergraduate level. I took it under Dr. Dal Flat, a wonderful man. But uh, in that class, my main research project explored whether Luke was the author of both Luke and Acts. And there is so much that has been written on that subject through the centuries. And what I concluded is there are some very good reasons to believe that both books were written by the same author, Dr. Luke. Uh, we find then that Luke and Acts are basically volumes 1 and 2, with volume 1, the book of Luke, covering the life of Jesus, and with volume 2, the book of Acts, covering the growth of the early church over the next 30 to 40 years. And so we should probably review some of what we know about Luke. If you were not here with us a few months ago when we started Luke, um, you may want to know that Luke was not a Jewish name. This is not uh, Judas or Saul or David or a name like that, but uh, Luke is a Greek name. And so Luke then was a Gentile. In Colossians 4.14, we also know that Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician. And so Luke was apparently a medical doctor. We know that Paul had some health concerns of his own, and so it would have been extremely valuable to have a doctor along on some of those missionary journeys. Some of you may know the church down in Estes, Tennessee, right outside of Henderson near Freed Hardeman, a church of several hundred people. They do some great work um, down, um, down in Jamaica and some of those other areas. And uh, they have done some amazing things down there with medical missions. They have a number of medical doctors and nurses and eye doctors uh, who are a part of their congregation. And, and that may be what we have going on here. Luke has been a, a great assistant to Paul on some of his travels. And we'll see that as we progress through this book. Assuming that both Luke and Acts are written by Luke, Luke writes more of the New Testament than any other writer. That almost sounds like some kind of a test question that might be coming up if we were having a test, but Luke writes more of the New Testament than any other. Paul wrote more letters, uh, but Luke writes more words. So Luke and Acts are both very fairly long books compared to the others in the New Testament. So Luke writes roughly one quarter of the New Testament. And that's amazing to me that a Gentile writes more or most of the New Testament. Uh, he never mentions his own name when he writes. This makes him different from some of the others. Unlike Paul, he never says, I, Luke, write you this letter. Don't we have Paul doing things like that in most of his letter? I, Paul, the apostle, write to you, and so on like that. Um, but Luke never mentions his own name. But we do know Luke is present a time or two because there are several we passages, we sections in the book of Acts. I'll make sure to point those out when we get there. Uh, it doesn't start until Acts chapter 16. It seems that uh, Paul picks Luke up on one of his journeys. So Luke doesn't join in until chapter 16. That's the first we passage where we did this instead of they did this. Uh, but that reminds us that Luke is not a first generation Christian. He was not personally an eyewitness to the Lord. But he comes in later and he does some research and then he connects with Paul a number of years into this. As far as timing goes, we find in the opening verses that Acts picks up where Luke's gospel account leaves off. Luke writes about Jesus, all that Jesus began to do and to teach, but it ends with Jesus being taken up into heaven. And as we just start to see in Acts 1 verse 2, this is where Acts picks up. So Acts then will focus in on the apostles. We see this here at the beginning, uh, a transition from what Jesus did and taught in person over to what the Lord's apostles did and what they taught. In verse 2, Jesus gives orders, and what comes next will be the apostles carrying out those orders. So we have the teaching of Jesus in Luke, and then we have the teaching of the apostles, which we're going to find matches up very, very well with the teaching of Jesus, but we have that recorded for us in the book of Acts. And this leads us to the, the purpose of this book, or maybe the benefits of having a book like this. Why did Luke write this, and, and why is it so important that we have this information? A number of reasons here. Uh, first of all, this is the history of the church. This is the history of the church, and as either an outsider or a new convert, Theophilus needs to know this. 
What am I getting myself involved in here? What is this all about? What, are, what is the history of these people? And, and if he needs to know that, then we also need to know this. At the end of the Gospel accounts, Jesus tells his followers to preach the good news to the whole world. Well, this is a history of that happening. This is how it happens. And so this is a, a book of history. Uh, secondly, in this book, we also have God's plan of salvation spelled out and demonstrated for us in the book of Acts. This is a record of how people became Christians. This is how they became followers of the Lord. So we have the Lord's teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the book of Acts, we have a record of people accepting that teaching and actually obeying the gospel. And so it's a history of the church. It's a record of God's plan of salvation being obeyed. Uh, thirdly, I would point out the book of Acts gives us a deeper respect and appreciation for both Peter and Paul. And that's very important because Peter and Paul basically write the rest of the New Testament. So Acts tells us more about these men and gives us a link between Jesus' teaching and their teaching. And also, just tied into this, just imagine not having Acts. Imagine Acts is missing. Imagine Luke didn't write this. And imagine having Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then going directly from John straight to Romans. Who in the world is this Paul guy? And, and why does he have a right to write anything to us? Why do we have to listen to this man? Why is he writing? And so Acts gives us some answers to those very natural questions. It explains how uh, Paul comes on the scene. It also gives us, as I said earlier, more respect for Peter. This is who Peter is. This is how he developed. This is how he grew. And this is how Peter turned into more of a leader in the Lord's church. So that's one reason Acts gives, gives us answers. A fourth a benefit or purpose for Acts, Acts explains how the church gets from Jerusalem to Rome. So it'll show us how the church expands. So I know that's tied into the history of the church. Um, but the church is going to end up making it all the way to Rome and beyond. And so Acts tells us how that happens. Uh, number five, Acts gives Luke a way to document the political innocence of the church. They are not out to overthrow the government, as some were starting to suggest in the early to mid-60s AD. So especially remembering that Luke is writing to perhaps a Roman government official. Luke is documenting these people are not political revolutionaries. This is not who they are. Uh, even though their leader was unjustly executed by the Romans, uh, Christians are law-abiding citizens. They are not out there to overthrow the Roman government. And so that's another benefit or purpose of the book of Acts is to document this. Uh, there's another benefit for us. This would be number six in my list here, and that is as the early church is established and as it grows, we have the written record of how they dealt with some of the problems that they faced. The church faces problems back then, also today. As my grandfather said over and over and over again, whenever discussing church issues or church problems in my presence when I was a kid, he would always say, remember, the church is a perfect organization made up of imperfect people. And I've change that or evolve that statement just a little bit in my own life, that the church is a perfect organization made up of imperfect people like us or like me. I'm one of those imperfect people. And so I'm just saying we will see this in the book of Acts. And it, it might have also been helpful to Theophilus so he doesn't get disillusioned that the church has problems because it's made up of mere mortals like the rest of us. But the book of Acts shows us how they work through those problems. And we'll make note of that as we progress. I'll probably mention this again also as we press forward, but Luke is also written in a way that we can verify its historical accuracy. And maybe that would be another purpose or benefit of the book, but it nails the growth of the church down in history. So it's not just a history of the church, but it ties it into secular history, and there are some overlaps that we can nail down between the book of Acts and secular history. Uh, this isn't a book that reads like a fairy tale. This isn't once upon a time in a land far, far away kind of thing. It's not a made-up story. But Luke mentions actual places and actual people. And that invites us to do our own research as fact-checkers. Uh, in his commentary on Acts, Wayne Jackson points out that Luke, the physician historian, mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, and 9 Mediterranean islands 
Also, he alludes to 95 different people, 62 of which are not mentioned by any other New Testament writer. 27 of these are unbelievers, chiefly civil or military leaders. And so the point is, Luke is not making stuff up, but he writes as an historian. And so he'll bring in Roman officials like Festus and Felix and and some of these other leaders like King Herod that we can verify from secular history. These are not made up names, but these are actual people who actually lived. As to the date when this book was written, it was probably written right around 61 AD. And I say this uh, because it has to be written late enough for Paul to get to Rome, but it seems to have been written before, obviously, Paul's execution and before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It would be almost uh, unheard of for, for Luke to write this book if he had written it after 70 AD without mentioning the destruction of Jerusalem. And so there's no mention of Paul's death, there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, but instead it ends simply with Paul's first Roman imprisonment. And so most scholars uh, would tend to date this book around 61 AD. Well, let's move into the next section, which would be Acts 1 verses 3 through 5. And I, I want to point out that our sections might be a little bit smaller in this study. Um, Acts is an important book. We are in no rush in this class. And when I watched class a few weeks ago, I noticed that um, I have been a fast talker lately. And uh, I will try to slow down. I've tried to slow down already tonight. But uh, before I hit the advance button for the next slide, I want us to notice just the last few words of Acts 1 verse 2. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus had given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And just a note on the Holy Spirit, Jesus had to ascend before the Holy Spirit could come. The Spirit would take his place, in a sense, on this earth. In John 16, 7, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And I just point that out to emphasize that this is a time of transition from the earthly ministry of Jesus to the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles and then ultimately inspiring the written word of God to be put down pen to paper. But uh, verse 2 ends with a reference to the apostles, and that very directly leads into verse 3. So let's go on to Acts 1, verses 3 through 5. Acts 1, 3 through 5. To these... He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Here, Luke continues to make the transition between Luke and Acts, reminding us that Jesus presented himself alive to the apostles after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing over a period of 40 days. So that's very specifically um, outlined here, as it really wasn't over in the book of Luke. We have more detail here than we did there. In terms of a timeline, the resurrection takes place on the first day of the week after the Passover. He ascends back into heaven 40 days after that. And then 10 days later, we have Pentecost, and that's a little bit later. We'll get to that in a moment and over the next couple weeks. Uh, during those 40 days when Jesus met with the apostles, we have a list of who Jesus met with over in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. And at some point toward the end of that 40-day period is when he gave them the Great Commission, telling them to go preach the gospel to the whole world and so on. Uh, but first, they had to wait. They had to stay in Jerusalem. They, they couldn't go preach the gospel everywhere, but they had to wait around for a little bit. Something else was happening that had to happen before they went and did that. And that's why we have the last phrase in verse 3. Uh, during that 40-day period between his resurrection and ascension, uh, Jesus spent a good part of that time speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Of course, we as God's people, as Christians, we know what's coming next. I think most of us have hopefully read the book of Acts. We know what's coming in Acts chapter 2. But Jesus is preparing these men for the establishment of his kingdom in Acts chapter 2. And so in that 40-day period, he spent a significant amount of time uh, teaching about the, uh, the kingdom of God. But I'm wondering, why would Jesus need to command the apostles to stay in Jerusalem? Why would they perhaps be... Uh, tempted to leave. I know if we were together, I would love to discuss that with you. You know, why might they want to get out of there, I guess, would be one way of asking that. 
We need to remember most of these men, they aren't from Jerusalem, are they? They're not from the city of Jerusalem. Most of them are from Galilee. And after everything they've been through, the natural tendency would be for them to want to go back home. To maybe go back to fishing up on the Sea of Galilee. A number of them had been commercial fishermen up there. Uh, there would also be some tension in the city of Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders had just killed Jesus, but he's been seen here and there. The apostles are on the verge of being wanted by the authorities. And so it was tense. It was a dangerous place to be at this moment. But Jesus commands them. I think that's the reason for the command. He's like, you must uh, stay in the city. Wait here for just a little bit until this next thing happens. So they are to wait for what the Father had promised, something that already heard from Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. And he reminds them, he's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it would happen not many days from now. So it's not forever, it's not months or years, it's just a few days off. It's not described here, but baptism with the Holy Spirit, I would point out, is not something they do. He doesn't say, baptize yourselves with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it is something that will be done to them. And also, I would point out, not done by another human being, uh, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit would be done by God himself, if we want to word it in that way. Uh, this thought continues down in verse 6. So let's go on to Acts 1, verses 6 through 8, the next paragraph here. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. In these appearances during these 40 days between the resurrection and ascension, the apostles apparently keep asking him, whether this is the time when he would be restoring the kingdom to Israel. And just based on the question, it seems to me that these men still have some confusion in their own minds concerning what the kingdom really is. That's something that they've always struggled with. I know as we've discussed a number of times as we've studied the gospel accounts, most of the Jewish people, including the disciples, assumed that God's kingdom would be a political kingdom, that the Messiah would come in and kick out the Romans and take things back to the way they used to be, back to the way it was during the rule of King David. Israel would once again be a powerful kingdom with riches and status and this huge military and so on. But notice, instead of arguing, instead of correcting these men, the time is short. And so he just seems to put it off for a bit. Don't be concerned about the timing of things. This is above your pay grade, we might say today. And then he directs them back to the Holy Spirit. So you'll, it'll be revealed to you, hang in there, you'll, we'll understand it all by and by, I think, as we sometimes sing kind of thing. Um, so they're in this brief few weeks of transition. Jesus is there, but he's on his way out. He's on his way back to heaven. And then the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and then everything would really make more sense in a way that it hadn't before. And once this happens... Once the Holy Spirit has come upon them, Jesus says, then they will be his witnesses. And we looked at that word a week or two ago. The apostles were witnesses. We are not, at least in the same way they were. But when they testify about the truth of Jesus as witnesses, uh, notice the plan. Notice their commission. A little more information about the direction here. They will start in Jerusalem. They will move out to Judea, then up to Samaria and then even to the remotest part of the earth. And so there is to be this progression. Some have compared this to a target, with Jerusalem in the middle, Samaria, and then moving out from there. Um, some have compared this to the, the ripples that happen when you throw a rock in a pond. And as you're about to see, I am in need of royalty-free maps of some Bible lands that we can live stream. That's, that's been a frustration, I think, with the live streaming over the really the past couple of years, even before the pandemic. Uh, previously, copyright law allowed us to use whatever we wanted to in worship and without regard for the copyright. If it was in worship, it was fair to use. And of course, when we started live streaming, that's, that's changed. And so then it's different. Then it's no longer in worship at a local church. Then we're publishing it. And, that, and so that made it complicated. A lot of images I wish I could use that I can no longer use because of this. There's some benefits, obviously, to the live stream, but this is one of the frustrations. And it, it's been difficult 
Um, since we've been live streaming, I've been, I think, pretty good at finding images that are free to use in this way, kind of secular images that in some way tie into what we're studying. But maps of the Bible lands have been extremely difficult. It is very, very hard to find good quality maps that are um, uh, licensed in a way that we can share them in a live stream format. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. Um, for tonight, though, you are stuck with me drawing circles. I'm afraid that's kind of the way it is for tonight. Uh, the circles illustrate what's going on here. Um, but we'll be needing more maps going forward. I wish I could have put a map kind of under this where we could look through the map. But uh, let's imagine Jerusalem where the apostles are. Jerusalem's located in the area of Judea. Samaria is the next region just to the north. Then we have uh, the rest of the world. So I guess the idea is they start where they are at the time. And then they move out from there. That's the concept. Uh, some have compared this to our concept of city, state, nation, and the world. And if we were to follow that pattern, uh, we would start at home and then we would move out from there. So it's kind of an interesting way of looking at that. Uh, we might also describe this in terms of our hometown and then our own culture, but outside our hometown. So I would say fellow cheeseheads here in Wisconsin. And then we have a similar culture, but maybe pretty different than we are in some areas. So kind of like our nation, perhaps. And then we have other places that have no idea what we're talking about. They're totally different than we are. And so there might be some application to us in that we start where we are and move out from there. Uh, but in context, this uh, the instruction from Jesus will serve as something, for, uh, something of an outline for the, the entire book of Acts. Again, going back to outlining a book, this is one key way of doing that. In the immediate future, these men will preach in Jerusalem, just in a matter of days from when this passage records. They will then quickly move out to the surrounding area. By Acts 8, they get up to Samaria. And when Paul comes in later in the book, we very quickly see progress to the remotest parts of the earth as Paul heads out on his missionary journeys, ending in Rome. And the book continues. It's almost like it just keeps on going. Uh, some have described us today as the Acts 29 church. There are 28 chapters in the book, but at the end of the book, Paul is still preaching un uh, unencumbered, unhindered. And so we are, in a sense, the Acts 29 church. We are the remotest parts of the earth. And here's something else to think about tied to that. Where are we right now in terms of the apostles when this command was first given? We are in the remotest parts of the earth, aren't we? It, it's hard to get farther away from Jerusalem than Madison, Wisconsin, and yet here we are. Uh, thankfully, God's plan worked. And the gospel has reached us 2,000 years later and on the other side of the world in a different language and in a far different culture than they were in back then. And that seems to be a great place for us to pause tonight. Let's Next week, let's pick up with Acts 1 verse 9. And next week, I want to also introduce the ABCs of Acts, a tool for remembering what's found in each chapter. So to prepare for class, you might want to read ahead, try to find a way to summarize what happens in chapter 1 with the letter A. So be looking for the first of the ABCs of Acts. What happens in chapter 1 that we can summarize with a word beginning with the letter A? And if I can, I'll try to send out some way, like a, a series of blanks, if you want to keep track of that. I, I know in my, most of my Bibles, I've written them down in front of the chapter headings, uh, what the ABCs of Acts are. I know some of you just use a device. I don't know if you have a way of uh, making comments or notations like that. Um, but anyway, be looking for that. I also know that like any college class, we get out of a study what we put into it. And reading the whole book at one time will hopefully see us, uh, let us see the big picture. So if you want to read the whole book of Acts at one sitting, it only takes about two and a half hours to read. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study with us tonight. Your time is valuable. I understand that. I never want to waste your time. I will do my best to always be prepared uh, for this class. And so I would invite you to go ahead and read the whole book if you're able. I hope to see all of you on Sunday at 9 a.m. Again, this would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help, and let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Luke and Peter and Paul. Thank you for your book. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your kingdom, the church. And thank you for giving us a way to study together tonight as a congregation. Thank you for allowing our congregation to teach others through the Bible correspondence courses, one of which focuses on the book of Acts. We pray that you would bless those who are studying, whether they are in prison or in some far-off place. 
We pray that you would continue blessing us with the resources necessary for teaching your word right here where we are in the remotest part of this earth. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.